came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples when they had heard this said, This is an hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It, it, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except that were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also walk, go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. For he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your house tonight. God, I pray that you would please just fill me with your spirit and your power, dear Lord. I pray that you would please help me to expound this, this great chapter, dear Lord. There's so much good doctrine here. I pray that you would please just um, help us all to stay intent and to stay focused. It's a really long chapter, dear God, but I pray that you would please help us to, to be attentive and not to be distracted with other things going on in our lives and our minds, dear Lord. Help us just to stay focused and, and that you would teach us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, John chapter 6. I'm going to try to hurry up through this. Like I said, there's a lot of stuff. There's no way I'm going to get to everything in this chapter. 71 verses in John chapter 6. But, I mean, it is packed. Just from reading this before we started, this is packed with so much good doctrine, so much, so much depth to God's Word in this chapter. It's just amazing. And it's really going to be hard to stay focused on just a few things. I'm going to try to skip through a lot of this. We're not going to go too deep into any one topic just because there's so much stuff. I want to hit some highlights. And um, so let's get started here. And verse number one says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. So there's a lot of people now that have paid attention. They've caught on to Jesus Christ performing all of these miracles, and they decide to follow him. Uh, obviously, I mean, you think about it, it only makes sense. You see a man, he's performing all these miracles, he's healing people, you know, he turned the water to wine. He did these things, and it's amazing. So now he's starting to get a multitude of people actually following him, and, and you know, he crosses the sea, they're going and following him with, you know, following with him just to see what he's going to do next, and, and to follow him here, it says in verse number 3, it says, And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. So he goes, you know, they're, they're walking around, they're doing their thing, and he goes up in his mountain, and he sits down with his disciples. It says, And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. So the Passover was real close. Verse number 5, it says, When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him. For he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus asked Philip this answer. There's, a, there's this huge multitude. There's this great company come unto Jesus Christ. They want to hear him. They want to learn from Jesus, right? They come unto him. He's up in this mountain. There's this huge multitude. And Jesus says to Philip, you know, where are we going to get food for these people to eat, basically? How are we going to take care of all these people? How are we going to get food for them to eat? And um, it says here, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. It's, he wasn't asking Philip for advice. He was, it says he was doing it to prove him. He was, he was testing Philip's faith and just to see what, what Philip would say in response to him. Um, and we see what Philip answers him in verse 7. It says, Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. Now that's a lot. Of, this kind of shows you what the multitude is. And we're going to see the number. It's like five, it's 5,000 men, not even including women and children. There's 5,000 men that are here. So when he says 200 penny worth, if you remember in the Bible, in, in a lot of these parables and stories, you know, men would work and they'd work like a 12 hour shift for a penny for a day. So you think of like one full day's labor is one penny. And he's saying here, you know, 200 penny worth, like 200 days worth of work of just, of just salary 
isn't enough to pay for everybody that's here to even get a little bit of food. So there's a lot of people, there's a great multitude. But when Jesus asks him this question, you know, Jesus is proving him. And sometimes he may test us, you know, we go through some things and, and God allows us, you know, there's questions posed to us in our life and God wants to see how we're going to respond to that. How, you know, what type of faith are we going to have in him? What's our response? And um, Philip here, you know, and I don't think there's anything sinful or wrong with Philip's response. But it also just kind of shows that um, there's still the little faith that they had. And, and, you know, again, not to down on Philip or anything, but just to have, this is the type of faith that we need to have in Christ, is full reliance and trust in Him. He's able to take care of every situation. He, you know, um, Philip doesn't know, basically. He's saying, you know, I, I mean, 200 pay worth isn't even enough to... to to feed all these people. Look at what's, let's keep reading. I love this parable. There's so much to learn just from this one parable alone. Um, whole sermons can be preached on this. Verse number eight says, One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? This is an attitude that um, we want to make sure we don't, we don't get caught up in. What are they among so many? So he's saying, you know, there's this, there's this boy here, right? This is a lad. He's got five loaves of bread and two fishes because their, their problem is what? The problem is they need to be able to feed people. So he's saying, well, you know, this is what we got. There's a little boy here. He's got, he's got five loaves and he's got two fishes, but, pff, you know, that's not even going to make a, that's not even a drop in the bucket. We've got, you know, over 5,000 people here. How, what is, what is that among so many? And of course, what we see here, Jesus Christ, um, turns that five loaves and two fishes into enough food to be sufficient for everybody. And one of the things that we could learn from this parable is, you know, you may not have that much to offer. You may not have much, but he brought what he had. What he had was five loaves and what he had was two fishes. And, and he brought that to Jesus. Jesus is able to multiply it. Jesus is able to take the little bit that you have, whatever little bit that you have to offer, whatever little abilities, whatever little skills you have, hey, bring it to Jesus. Offer it up to him. Say, here you go, Jesus. I know it's not much, but I'm going to give it unto you. And he'll bless that. You bring what you have and just give it unto him completely. Just say, here you go, God. I'm offering this up to you. Jesus can turn, Jesus works miracles. Jesus can turn around and make it do everything that needs to be done. And even more than what needs to be done, because when we read here, they take up all the fragments. And they have more left over than what they started with. And it's all based on one little boy saying, I've got five loaves and two fishes, here you go. You know, it's not much. It's not much, but this is what I have. This is what I have to work with. And God will bless you for that. And God, God blesses this. He likes to see that. Just like he said with, I mentioned this last week, the widow that cast in the two mites. And, um, you know, Jesus said she cast in more than everybody. I mean, you can have a rich man of his abundance, you know, throwing a thousand dollars in the plate, but, you know, a poor widow, this is all she's got. She's just giving it all to God and saying, you know, the Lord's will be done or whatever. Whatever she, I mean, I don't know exactly what she said, but she was just throwing in all, all, of, her, all of her living. Just whatever she had, she's giving it to God and just, just going to rely on God to take care of her and um, you know, not trusting in the riches whatsoever. And God's able to do a lot more with that little bit than, than not that he can do with, with more, but he likes using the, the, the small to do great miracles. But we ought not to have that, because what that adds is the attitude of what are they among so many is an attitude of discouragement. That can cause you to not give God what you have because you're thinking, well, I, I, it's not, I'm not good enough anyways. And that's why a lot of people like, will, will have that, that defeated attitude of saying, well, I hardly even know the Bible at all, so why should I even go out soul winning? Or I, I hardly even, you know, whatever. Like, I, I, I've, I've done, I live all these sins, so what's the point of even going to church? That's actually one of the biggest things that gets people out of church. They think like, oh, well, I've sinned. You know, someone will like, um, you know, especially if people are newly saved or whatever, you know, maybe they're, they're still struggling with sins in their life. And maybe they go out to the bar and say, well, there's no way I could go to church now on Sunday because I, I, I screwed up, I went out, and I did this sin, you know, I got drunk. And is drinking a sin? Absolutely it's a sin. It's a wicked sin. You shouldn't be doing it. And, and you know, obviously we're going to preach against it, but don't let that sin, because what you're going to do is you're going to let that sin compound then when, it, when you allow that to keep you out of church. 
When you say, you know, what you ought to have is the repentant heart, say, I did wrong, but now I'm just going to go to church and just start right from today. Push that reset button and just, just go forward. You know, forget those things which are behind and move towards, move, um, <laughs> reach for those things which are before and press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus. Don't have that type of defeated attitude. Don't, don't, type, don't have that, I'm not good enough. I can't do this. I can't do this. What is that among somebody? What are my skills? I can't do anything. No, God can use it. God can use what you have if you're willing. If you're willing to come to him and just give it to him and say, you know what? It's not much. This is what I have. And, um, and God can bless that and use that in a great way. Let's keep reading here. In verse number 10, it says, And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number, about 5,000. There we get the number. 5,000 people. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down. And likewise of the fishes, as much as they would. As much as they would means as much as they wanted. People got to eat as much as they wanted, from five loaves and two fishes. Jesus gave thanks to God. You know, this is what we have. We've got five loaves and two fishes. We're going to bless it. We're going to bless God. God, thank you for these five loaves and two fishes. Thank you for providing this food for us. Again, don't overlook that either. Whatever food you have in your house, you might say this attitude, you know, oh, I'm getting sick of eating rice every day. I'm getting sick of eating this every day because, you know, maybe you don't have that much money. Maybe you're struggling financially. Never have that type of an attitude. Well, how are we going to figure out? Look, Bless God and thank Him for the things that you have. Have the right attitude. Look, God can bless that food. God can bless, you know, make sure that you are fed well enough. Don't have this evil attitude of it's not good enough for me and get exalted and get proud. We need to make sure that we're always giving thanks unto God. All they had was that five, bread, five loaves and two fishes, but Jesus blessed it. He gave thanks to God. And look at what happens here. It says, He distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that were set down. This is, in a way, this is what we do, right? It, it, we're going to look at this a little bit more figuratively now. We think of the bread, the bread that, that Jesus is feeding unto the people. Obviously, it's their nourishment, but deeper than that, we're going to see here, Jesus is the bread of life. He goes into that for many, many verses in this chapter. God's word is referred to as bread, as our nourishment, as the manna that comes down from heaven, right? There's all these things are, are, are illustrative and, and, you know, a picture of God's word, that bread. And what Jesus is doing, well, first, he's giving it to his disciples. He's giving his word. He's giving his truth. He's giving his knowledge to his disciples. The disciples are following closely. And that's what we should be receiving from Jesus Christ here. And then it's up to us to take that same knowledge out to the masses, out to the people. So he had the few, he had the 12, he had his disciples that were close with him, that were getting it directly from Jesus. And then what they were doing is they were bringing the same exact bread, the same exact message, the same exact words of Jesus Christ. They were bringing that out to the whole multitude. That's our job. We are to bring that living bread to the multitude. We get it straight from Jesus. We get his words straight from him here at church. We hear it, but we need to take these words and bring it out to the multitude and feed them and make sure that they can hear it and they can receive that bread of life. <clears throat> Let's keep reading here. Verse number 12 says, when they, were, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain that nothing be lost. Jesus doesn't want to waste anything. He's not a waster. Say, okay, you're filled, you're satisfied. Everybody had enough to eat, but now let's go, let's go um, collect the rest, the fragments up, so we don't lose this. We're not just wasting what God has given us here. Verse number 13, Therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained over and above unto them that eat. Five loaves of bread is not going to fill up 12 baskets just by themselves. So you notice here, they ended up with more than what they started with. God blessed them so much that not only was everybody able to be fed, they were able to be filled. They were able to be filled so much that they left over. That is just, I can't eat anymore. And they were able to take up 12 full baskets of the leftovers from what they ate. That is an extreme blessing. That is, that is an extreme miracle for over 5,000. This just is the 5,000 men. There were women and children there as well, but that's just counting the men. That's how many people, you know, it was a, a ton of people ate there. 
just based off those five loaves and two fishes. Um, verse 14 says, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. So people see it. This is a big miracle. And people who knew, you know, he's only got five breads and two fishes, and, and they just keep, it just keeps coming. They just keep handing out and handing out and handing out. And people sat down in companies, sat down in groups, and they just kept on going. You know, just, just kept on grabbing more bread, just, just giving out, giving out. And that's a pretty amazing thing. I mean, I don't know about you. I'd be, I'd be pretty stunned. I'd want to keep following Jesus if I saw that miracle as well. Um, <laughs> verse number 15. The Bible says, When Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force to make him a king, he departed again into a mountain himself alone. So what happened is people are so you know, caught up in this miracle, they're willing to say, like, we need to make him king. He's going to be our king. We're just going to take him right now. Like, not even going to ask him. We're just going to physically take him and just make him the king. And it obviously was not Jesus' time. That's not what he was supposed to do. He didn't come the first time to become the king of Israel. Um, so he had, to, he had to back off then from them. He had to go up in the mountain by himself. He said, okay, well, wait, this is getting too serious. These guys are going to make me a king. It's not time for that yet. So he went by himself alone. Verse 16 says, And when even was now come, his disciples went down unto the sea and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. So Jesus goes up into the mountain by himself. He goes up into the mountain to pray. You can get that from the other Gospels. And he sends his disciples away. So the disciples get into a boat and they, and they start crossing the sea here. It says in verse 19, So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh unto the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land whither they went. Now, I'm going to cover this briefly, but this is something that was shown to me by Pastor Anderson in, in, in a sermon that he preached about a year ago, and this just this blew me away, this truth. We're going to cover it more briefly tonight. I, I would suggest going home and finding that sermon. I think it was, um, it's called something of Jesus walking on the water or something like that. He go, he's going to go into this more depth than, than I'm going to tonight because I want to get through this whole chapter, but I have to bring it up because it is... It is incredibly amazing. Um, one thing that's important, and, and I like doing this a lot, when you read, you read different things, and I brought this up in previous sermons, you read stuff in the Bible and you're wondering, like, why, why is that in there? What's the, what's the purpose? Why is that information included in the Bible? What does it mean? Um, God's Word is perfect and everything is in there. It's not by accident. It's not like he just gives us extra information that we don't need. So in this story, when it says, look at verse 19, it says, so when they had rowed, this is the disciples, they're in the ship. And just, just to get the story, right? Jesus is in the mountain. His disciples go into this ship. There's strong winds, there's turmoil, there's a storm on the sea, and they're really struggling and fighting and rowing this boat. And they get about halfway into the sea, and that's when they see Jesus walking on the water, right? And then... And then they invite him into the ship when they find out it's him. Because at first they're scared. They don't realize that's him. He said, it's me. You know, don't be afraid. So they, he comes into the ship. And then as soon as he gets in the ship, boom, they're at the other side. So they're halfway through the sea. But then as soon as Jesus comes in the sea, uh, into the ship, they're, just, they're, they're at the destination. Just immediately. And um, we're going to cover these points. So um, one of the pieces of information we get here, it says, so when they had rowed in verse 19, about 5 and 20 or 30 furlongs. So it's like, why do we care how far they went? You know, what, why is that even added there? Well, a furlong, it's not something we're very familiar with today necessarily. A furlong isn't a, measure, a unit of measure that we use that much. But a furlong is basically, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to condense this down, it's about an eighth of a mile. So today, you know, um, in most cities, a city block is approximately an eighth of a mile. So if you go like eight blocks, typically you're going to go a mile. Um, that's, that's the way most cities are laid out in the United States. Um, a block is one-eighth of a mile. Well, that's the same distance as a furlong. So if you think of a furlong, it's like a, it's like a city block. So you go eight blocks, you've gone a mile. You go eight furlongs, you've gone a mile. Now, he doesn't give us an exact measure. It's an approximate. He's approximating. He says about 25 or 30. So 25 or 30 furlongs 
How many miles would that be? You think about it, divided by 8, right? 25 or 30 divided by 8? About a little over, around 3.5, roughly. So we got 3.5 miles is halfway through the sea, so the sea is roughly 7 miles across, right? If they're halfway through, the sea's about 7 miles, they get about halfway through, it's roughly 3.5. I mean, obviously, give or take, when you, when you do the 25 versus 30 furlongs on, on how far they've gone. They're about 3.5 miles into this. This is a picture of the rapture. This is a picture of end times prophecy right here. And this is, this is amazing. Because this, this blew me away when, when I heard this. And it's just, it's just so true. So think about it. They're in the sea and they're rowing. They're toiling. They're going through this turmoil. They're fighting against the wind. And they get about three and a half years into it, which is the exact amount of time that the, you know, for the, the, tribu the great tribulation that's going to happen before Jesus Christ comes back in the, in the clouds, as is mentioned in Matthew 24 and in many other places, we see um, you know, we, we, the, the saved, the saints are going to go through tribulation, and then Jesus Christ is going to come back in the clouds. And the Bible says, let's just turn to Matthew 24 real quick, because um, it's important just to kind of draw these parallels and these comparisons here. Verse 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world, to this time no nor ever shall be, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And you think about that, right there, we draw a parallel. Remember when Jesus got into the boat, their journey was shortened, wasn't it? As soon as they got in, he got in the boat, boom, they're at the other side. They didn't have to go the extra three and a half miles to get to the other side. As soon as he gets there, as soon as he shows up, they're already at the other side. Draw that parallel with this, except those days should be shortened. Um, there should no flesh be, be saved, but for the next day, they shall, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto thee, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not, for there shall rise false Christ and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they should de shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. He's basically just saying, look, there's a warning saying, you know, a lot of people could be saying, Jesus Christ has come back saying, don't believe him because every eye is going to see him. Just like the lightning goes across the sky, everyone sees that lightning. It's going to be the same thing when Jesus Christ comes back. Don't be deceived by what these other people are saying. There's going to be troubles, persecutions, great tribulation. Verse number 29 says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the, of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And that's, that's when the rapture happens. That's when the elect, the saved, those that believe in Christ, are gathered together. It's at Jesus Christ's coming. The sun, is, sun and moon are darkened. The stars fall from heaven. All these events that happen, do you see this event re recounted over and over again in the Bible? The same events of Jesus Christ's return. We see that here. Um, turn if you would to Mark chapter 6 because we're going to see this parallel passage that we're reading in John chapter 6 and Mark chapter 6. We're going to see one more aspect to this parallel that we have. So we have three and a half miles going in which can equate to the three and a half years of, that, of the tribulation that we're going to be going into. Or, or really more correctly stated it would be of... Um, Daniel's, Daniel's 70th week, right? So that week would be like seven days and in the midst of that week is when, um, is when the abomination of desolation is going to be set up. There's going to be great tribulation and then Jesus Christ is going to come back and then um, God's going to pour out his wrath for the rest of that, of that week. Um, but that rapture happens, occurs approximately in the middle. Um, 
as we saw here in the sea. So we're in Mark chapter 6, look at verse number 45. This is a parallel to John 6 where we were reading. The Bible says, And straightway he constrained his disciples to get into the ship and to go to the other side before unto Bethsaida while he sent away the people. This is when Jesus was in the mountain and he tells his disciples to go back into the ship. Verse 46 says, And when he had sent them away, he departed into a mountain to pray. And when even was come, the ship was in the midst of the sea. So there we see it was in the middle of the sea and he alone on the land. See, in John 6, it didn't tell us it was in the middle. It just said they had gone um, 25 or 30 furlongs. Here we see it was in the middle of the sea. Um, and then it says in verse 48, And he saw them toiling and rowing, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he cometh unto them, walking upon the sea, and would have passed by them. So here we see the time that this happens. We see that they're, they're halfway through the sea. They're halfway through this great struggle and this turmoil and fighting the wind when he shows up. But it's also during the fourth watch. And again, the fourth watch, it's in there not by accident. Turn, if you would, to Daniel chapter 7. We're going to see why the fourth watch is important and how this all lines up so perfectly and completely in Scripture. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel is after the major prophets. You have Psalms and Proverbs and um, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Lamentations and Ezekiel. And then you'll um, get into Daniel. Daniel chapter number 7. And we're going to look at verse number, start reading in verse number 13. This is one of the visions that Daniel has about, about end times prophecy here. Verse 13 says, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the ancients of day, ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. So here we see again the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, coming in the clouds of heaven. It's the same event. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. Oh, I'm sorry. This is... Um, <laughs> it's talking about the ancient days. So here, yeah, never mind. Let's keep going. I'm not correcting anything yet. Verse 14 says, And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. Verse 15 I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by me and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. These great beasts which are four are four kings which shall arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast which was diverse from all the others, exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron, and his nails of brass, which devoured, break in pieces, and stamped the residue with his feet, and of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the others which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. And again, compare this with Revelation. Compare this to the prophecies as Revelation about the Antichrist and when he comes into the power and the ten horns and the ten kings. This all matches up perfectly with the end times prophecy that we can see in Revelation and the Antichrist. Verse 21 says, I beheld and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. This is the great tribulation. This is the Antichrist. This is coming to, to make war against the saints. Verse 22, until the ancient of days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. And the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them. And he shall be diverse from the first and he shall subdue three kings and he shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. So here again we see that he's going to be get this for a time is one, times is two, and the dividing of time is a half. There's three and a half years. Um, so 
I'm not, we can keep reading the chapter, but I'm not going to do it there because basically we see the fourth kingdom is the kingdom of the Antichrist. It's the worldwide kingdom. It's the one that's been different from all the other kingdoms that came before. And it's when this, it's during this kingdom, that reign of the Antichrist, is when Jesus Christ is going to come back. And that's when the rapture happens. So we see here in Mark 6, 48, when it said the fourth watch of the night, it's referring to a parallel that lines up exactly with the fourth kingdom of the Antichrist. It, it's just, it's, it's really mind-blowing. And again, you're going to have to listen, go back and listen to Pastor Anderson teach on this because he goes into a little bit more detail than I did tonight. Let's flip back to John chapter 6. But um, I, I, <laughs> it, it's so amazing what the Bible has in its pages when, when you study and, and when you look at, at how much parallels we can find in even just this, what we seemingly the simplest of stories. You might look at that and be like, what is, what can we learn from all this? Like, okay, they're rowing, you know, it's giving us all this information about how far it is and about, you know, they're in the middle of the sea and they're struggling and Jesus walks on the water. It's like you'd think you'd be more focused on Jesus walking on the water than just on all these details of this event. But, but God's word is so incredibly and amazingly perfect and fits together so well. I mean, you, you can't, man cannot produce this. Man cannot produce a work like this where you, where you have these similarities and these analogies and these greater truths being taught in such a way that there is no way this is a coincidence. Everything fits together like a puzzle perfectly. All these pieces fit together um, perfectly. Um, but I, I had to point that out for you because this, that, it blew me away when I saw it because it's just, it's in there and it's something you have to dig a little bit deeper for. It's not something you just notice right away immediately on the surface until you really start thinking about these things and like, why is this important? You start doing some, some searching in, in the rest of the scriptures as to what, where are the similarities with this. But this story, I believe, right here is teaching us a pre-wrath rapture. But let's continue on here. So we were in, we just finished with verse number 21, which should be in verse number 22. The Bible says, The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one whereinto his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread. After that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. So the multitude that got sent away, they see, okay, Jesus and his disciples aren't here anymore. And they want to go out and find him. So they, they cross the sea as well. Verse 25 says, And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? They're asking, when did you get here? Because they knew that he said, you know, his disciples went away, but he didn't. They knew that he didn't go into the boat with them. So they're like, how did you get here? When did you come here? That's what they're asking him, but he doesn't answer him that question. Look at verse number 26. It says, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Now, earlier in the chapter, we saw that the people that followed him, when there was that multitude, before they were fed, when they were just following him, it said that they saw the miracles that they did, and that's why they followed him. But he's saying to these people now, this group, he's saying, okay, you're not following me because of the miracles I did. You're just following me because I fed you. You're following me because you got a free meal. Right? That would be like people just, just showing up to church because, you know, we offer a, a soul winner's lecture. So like, that's why I'm coming. Like, like I'm just going to show up here for the food. You don't care about the teaching. You don't care about what Jesus is, is doing. You're just there to get something for free out of the deal. You're just there, you know, someone just coming and asking for charity. They don't want to hear from the Bible. They don't want to hear what Jesus has to say. They just want to get the handout. And basically, that's what Jesus is rebuking them for. And this is a common theme, though, what he says he says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. 
This is a constant reminder. This has been coming up a lot in my sermons lately, and it's not because like I have this great desire. I'm like, no, I gotta keep on preaching. I gotta keep on preaching this. It comes up frequently because it's found frequently in Scripture. This idea, this 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 concept that we shouldn't be so focused with the worldly treasures. Don't get so caught up in earning the money and, and you know buying the food and making the money for the bread. Don't get caught up in that because it's easy to get distracted because it is a necessity, because it's a need that we need to we need to make money, we need to to, to buy food for ourselves, but it's too easy to get caught up in that. It's too easy to get distracted from serving God and to forget the more important things and just keep following all, following the way of the world. Because this is the world's mentality. This is what can I do to earn more money, to get more toys, to get more things and accumulate wealth? This is, by and large, this is the world's mentality. And we are inundated with this every day. And I believe that's why this is in Scripture so much. Like I said, I'm not just picking these things out. This is here. This is something we read over and over and over again. It's a common theme where Jesus is saying, look, labor not for the meat which perisheth. That's not what you should be, have your focus on. Focus on the meat which endureth unto everlasting life. That is what we need to make sure is our primary goal, our primary focus. We need to continually remind ourselves of this on a day-to-day -day basis not to get too caught up in these other things. Not to get so focused on money and on food and on wealth and all this other stuff. It's all going to perish. It's all going to go away. Think about how hard you work. And if you're just, just working your fingers to the bone just to, make, just to make a bunch of extra money. Now, I'm not saying, look, if you have to work your fingers to the bone just to support your family, then that's what you have to do. If that's where you're at and, and you know, to provide food and clothing and a place to live for your family, then hey, yes, by all means, do that. That's what you have to do. But these people who just work and work and their whole life is about working just, just so they can accumulate wealth, that is wrong. That is wicked. We need to make sure that we are not getting caught up in that type of mindset. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 28 says, Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And see, a lot of people have this, um, you know, it's ridiculous. I, I've heard someone recently saying that, oh, if you pray with someone after you give them the gospel, that's a work salvation because prayer is a work, because people labor in prayer. So see, prayer is a work. So see, you're teaching works-based salvation. That's ridiculous. It's the same people that want to turn to a verse like this and say, oh, see, believing is a work. When they're not even understanding what Jesus is saying. See, the question was asked to him, hey, what works can we do? Right? We want to work the works of God. You just say, look, this is the work. You just need to believe. Right? Don't get caught up and worry about all these good works that you need to do to get you to heaven. You need to just do the work of putting your faith in Christ. That's it. That's what, need, what you need to be saved. Because um, you got to remember, he's still talking to a, to a multitude here. Or um, maybe a multitude of these people who are following him that were, he was just got done saying that they followed him because they were fed. That's the reason why they sought him. So he's, he's not worried. They're worried about, well, what can we do to do good works? And he's saying, you don't need to worry about the works yet because you need to get saved. You need to, to put your faith in Christ. You need to put your faith in God. That was his answer to him. He's not saying that believing is a work. He's just, you know, if you understand what he's saying, you know, people use um, figures of speech and it doesn't necessarily mean that, oh, well, see right here, that means believing is a work. And the Bible says that, you know, it's not of work, so there's a contradiction in the Bible. No, there's not. You just don't understand what he's saying. Verse number 29, or verse number 30, says, They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So, and Jesus is going to answer them here. Now they're saying, okay, you want us to believe. Well, what, what are you doing? They're saying, what works do you do? Which is amazing because these are the same people that just ate of the five loaves and two fishes. Well, what work do you do? That miracle wasn't enough to see him? And they're saying, well, well Moses fed us with manna. What they said, they're attributing the manna that came down from heaven, the angel's food that God provided for the children of Israel. They're attributing that to Moses. 
And they're saying, well, see, well, we could believe Moses because Moses gave us manna to eat. What do you do? You know, what, what kind of work do you have? How are you going to prove yourself to us? What sign do you show us? The, the five loaves and two fishes wasn't enough of a sign for you? 5,000 people fed from five loaves of bread? That's not enough of a sign for you? And see, for some people, nothing is ever enough. It doesn't matter. They can see Jesus Christ performing miracles, but it's just not going to be enough for their hard heart to just put their faith in him. And that's why you can sometimes there's people, I mean, you can show them scripture after scripture after scripture. They can see God working in people's lives, but it's not going to be enough for them. Some people just never, nothing is ever enough for them. And we ought not to have that hard heart. But there, there are a lot of people out there that have that. They, were, they met Jesus Christ face to face. They were able to see with their own eyes the miracles that he did, yet they refused to put their faith in him. That was just not good enough for them. But Jesus answers them. Because they're wrong, in what, and even in their belief anyways, of saying, oh, well, Moses gave us his bread from, you know, gave us manna. Look at verse number 32. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. So you said, look, that wasn't Moses that gave that to you. That was God. God gives you the true bread from heaven. Verse number 33 says, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. So basically he's saying it's him. And that's what he's going to, he's going to flat out just say that he is that bread. Um, verse number 34 says, Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. Verse 35 says, And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And this is a, this is a great section of Scripture here. We're going to focus in a little bit of the, of the eternal security that Jesus Christ gives us in salvation. He says, I am that bread of life. He that cometh to me, he says, you're never going to hunger. Because look at what they said is, look, evermore give us this bread. So they're thinking, they're still thinking, like, you need to keep getting it over and over and over. Keep on giving us this bread forever. And Jesus is explaining to them, no, look, you don't get it. You still don't get it. If you come to me, you're never going to hunger again. You need this meal one time. You need this bread one time. Just like the woman at the well, he can give you living waters so that you will not thirst again. You will not need another. You won't have to keep on coming back for more. And that's what a lot of people today, you know, you ask them, what do you need to do to be saved? They'll say, well, you got to ask for forgiveness. And they'll think that like every time you sin, you got to keep asking for forgiveness. You got to ask for forgiveness. Well, I sin. Now I got to ask for forgiveness. I sin. I got to ask for forgiveness. Now, there's nothing wrong with when you sin. You ought to go to God humbly and repent and be sorry and, and go to God and, and just, you know, confess and forsake your sins. But that is not for salvation. When the people who I was just referring to, they're talking about being saved. They're thinking that like, well, if you sin, you're not saved until you ask God for forgiveness. Then all of a sudden you're saved. And then when you sin again, you're not saved. And then you have to ask God. And, and this is what they think. And this is what they believe. And this is, this is very similar to what these people are saying. Look, evermore give us this bread. You have to keep on going back to him. Jesus saying, no, look, you just need to do this one time. I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. You partake of that bread of Jesus Christ, you're never going to hunger again. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. It's never going to happen again. You're, you're done. It's taken care of. Verse number 36. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. Again, and, 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 you know, he's preaching these people. He wants them to get saved. He's, he's giving them what they need to know to be saved, but they're not saved yet. They still don't get it. They have, they have all this stuff. You know, he's, he's, he's loving them. He's teaching them. He's trying to show them. But he's telling them, look, you don't believe. You're not saved. Verse number 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Again, another great eternal security verse. Look, Anyone that comes to Jesus, he says, I will in no wise, no way am I going to cast them out. He says, there is not a condition that can happen where I am going to cast that person out. It's not going to happen. There is no exceptions. I will in no wise cast them out. Anyone that comes to Jesus. Verse 38, for I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will 
of him that sent me. Now, what person alive today can say, I came down from heaven? Nobody. We didn't come from heaven. God created us in the womb. We did not come down from heaven. Jesus Christ is the only one. He knew he was God in the flesh, and that's who he claimed to be. We see this over and over again, the proof in the Bible, because there's some people that like to say that, oh, well, Jesus didn't claim to be God. That's, that's what his disciples said later, and it got exaggerated. And people who, who like to look at history say, oh, no, no, they just exaggerated and, and made this religion into a lot more than what Jesus actually said. Uh, no, that's not the case. When Jesus said, I and my Father are one, when Jesus says that I came down from heaven, not to do mine, will, mine own will, but the will of him that sent me, and this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And again, see, the, the eternal security in, this, in this, this section of Scripture is amazing. Everything that God's given to him, he says, I should lose nothing. Not one person is going to be lost, but should raise it up again at the last day. Hey, everyone that's saved, you're going to be raised up again at the last day by Jesus Christ because that's God's will. And, God, and Jesus Christ always does God's will. His will is going to be done. Verse number 40, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Everybody, everyone that believes on him, it says you have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. This is the message that people need to hear. This is the message that he's preaching to these lost people. They saw the miracles, but they didn't believe. He's trying to explain it to them and they're, and they're talking with them. They're not necessarily completely rejecting it. At first, they come back to him with Moses. They say, well, what do you do? And Jesus corrects them. And then it says, well, okay, well, we want to have this bread. You know, just keep giving it to us. He says, no, you still don't understand. You, you, know, you don't believe. You need to believe. And that's what he says. You know, believe, everyone that um, seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Verse number 41 says, The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven. Again, just obviously they don't believe. They think they know. They think, oh, Joseph is his father. That's what they think. But is Joseph really Jesus' father? Nope. Nope. They're judging according to the appearance. But they're not judging righteous judgment. See, they're judging what they see externally. <clears throat> just in the fact that, oh, Jesus was brought up by Mary and Joseph, therefore Joseph is his father. No, not true. And they don't know that. They just assume that. They think they know that, but it's not the truth. Um, <clears throat> when he's doing all of these works and his miracles, proving who his father really is. So their logic is so messed up. And, and that's why some people got it. They say, look, no man can do these things except the father be with him, except the father ascend him. Like, Jesus Christ can have, could not have done everything that he did, all those miracles, unless God was with him, unless he was doing God's work. This, it would have been impossible. And for him to say he was the son of God and God's with him doing all these things, you know, that's why they, that's why they took him to be like Satan instead of, instead of the son of God because um, they, they had no way of explaining it and they didn't believe and they didn't want to believe that what he was saying was the truth. They heard the truth, but they didn't receive it. Verse 43, Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now I want to cover this real quick. Um, there's a false preaching out there that people will use this verse. And it's a, lot of, it's, a, it's, a, it's a favorite verse of Calvinists who like to say, well, God picks and chooses who gets saved. So they'll say like, well, no, no, not everyone can get saved, only those who God draws to Jesus. And that's why they, that's why they call it, but when they're tulip, they call it irresistible grace. So that what they say is that when, you know, when God draws you, when God calls you, you can't resist that because if God's doing it, you're just, you're just going to get pulled in no matter what because that's God's will and that's what God wants. And 
it's stupid. Yes, I agree. Shake your head. It's, it's not right. But um, this is one of the verses they'll go to. And, you know, don't let this bother you when it says that um, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Flip over real quick. Where am I at my notes? To John chapter number 12. Because we're going to see here that while this is true, look at John chapter number 12. It's not just for a few specific people. John 12 verse 32. John 12 32 says, And, and I, this is Jesus Christ speaking, if I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So he's saying there, you know, you can't, you know, no one can come unto him except those that are drawn. Well, he says, well, if I'm, if I'm lifted up from the earth, I'm going to draw all men unto me. So it's not just a specific few; it's it's everybody. And did Jesus get lift, get lifted up from the earth and hung up on a cross? Absolutely, he did. So if, he said, if that happens, then I'm going to draw all men unto me. Jesus is drawing all men unto him. God is drawing. It's not just a few. So. Yeah, you can't go in unless you draw him, but Jesus is drawing all men unto him. Verse number 45 says, It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God. He hath seen the Father. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Again, great verse. It says it all right there. It sums up salvation. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Verse 48, I am that bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna, eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. So now he's explaining again. Look, the manna in the wilderness, your fathers ate that manna and they're dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Great soul winning verses here. This is exactly what Jesus is trying to do. He's preaching soul winning unto these people who are lost. These people are not saved. And he's saying, I am that living bread. And, and just to make it clear for you, that bread is my flesh. I'm going to give my body. I'm going to give my flesh so that the whole world can be saved. It's for everybody. Verse 52. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? They just they see they simply cannot grasp these spiritual concepts at all. They continually are thinking in the flesh and of the flesh. They're saying, how can he give us his flesh to eat? Like they're just thinking, like they're literally like cannibals. Like we're gonna eat this man's flesh. How can he do this? They're just completely dumbfounded. Just like Nicodemus was when Jesus said, "You must be born again." He's like, "How can I, you know, man be born when he is old? Can he go the second time into his mother's womb and be born?" He's thinking physically, and all these people is keep thinking. They're hearing what Jesus is saying, and they're not understanding. They don't perceive. They don't get it because it's spiritually discerned, and they don't believe. They just believed him. All this stuff came to them. And that's where it says that the common people, they heard him and received him gladly. They were under, able to understand all these concepts that Jesus was talking about because they believed. Because they had faith on him. That opened up their understanding. Yeah, sure. It's not difficult for them at all. But the Jews here, it says they, 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 they struggled with this. It says they strove among them. They fought. They argued. They couldn't understand. What is he talking about? And the same doctrine of this, you know, giving us his flesh to eat exists today. There's a bizarre Catholic doctrine that teaches, it's called transubstantiation is, is the, you know, one of the official names for it. But basically in the Catholic Church, they perform what they call the Eucharist. And that's similar to what we would call, you know, when we partake in communion. When um, they, um, they eat the wafer and they drink the wine. What the Catholic Church teaches they teach that you're receiving the wafer, but when that wafer comes into your mouth, that somehow it physically, literally becomes Christ's flesh. And when you drink the wine, it literally becomes his blood. And they say that, like, they can't understand it. They'll call it mystery, but, like, 
That's what they believe is happening, that you are eating Christ's flesh and drinking his blood when you partake in it. That's just bizarre, okay? Jesus Christ is obviously giving us an illustration, and he makes the connection when he says bread and eating bread because that's something you physically eat, and saying that it's his flesh, and, and he's drawing the parallels back and forth, just showing how he's going to give himself to be meat for us, to be life for us. As you eat bread, it gives you life, it sustains you. If you take Jesus Christ, if you accept him as your Savior, you believe on him, he becomes your life and your sustenance and will maintain you. It, it's the same comparison, but um, they just they, they, it just completely goes over the head. They don't get it. Verse number 53 says, then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. And this is a verse that Catholics will turn to. Gonna, See, look. You have to eat his flesh and drink his blood, or else you have no life in you. So that's where they come up with these bizarre doctors, just because they don't understand Scripture. Because they're not saved. Because it just goes way over their head. They, they try to use Christ's words, and they rest them. They, 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 they twist them. They don't understand them at all. Verse 54 says, Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. And the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. He doesn't back down one bit when they don't understand this. He just comes at them even, even harder and just saying, Look, I am the bread of life. You need to eat my flesh and drink my blood in order to have the... That's how much you have to... You just have to believe, right? And um, he's saying, This is different than the bread that your fathers ate in the wilderness. They ate that man and they died. But whoso takes of this bread, this bread of life, will live forever. Verse 59 says, These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, This is an hard saying, who can hear it? So even a lot of his disciples that were following him didn't understand what he was talking about. They're saying, This is a hard saying, who can hear it? When Jesus knew it himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. So here's he, he's explaining it. Look, it's the Spirit. The flesh does nothing. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So even as the disciples are saying, like, look, the flesh profits nothing. It's not about the flesh. It's the spirit that makes you alive. It's the spirit that quickens. And he says, um, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. Great verse to use to show people that the words of God are extremely important. It's not just the message. It's not just the thought. It's not just some theme or main idea that matters. It's Jesus Christ's words. It's God's words plural. It's not the overall message. It's each individual word. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. His words are spirit, and they are life. That is why we have a Bible that we believe is every word of God, because the words are important, because the words are the words that are spirit, and they are life. The words are what get people saved. It's the spirit that quickeneth, and the words that he speaks, he said, they are spirit, they are life, which is why we use the Bible in getting people saved. If you're not using the Bible to get someone saved, they ain't going to get saved. They need the words of God, this, that spirit and that life, to pierce them and to hear and to receive and to believe. Jesus Christ is the word. We need his word. Jesus Christ was perfect. God's word is perfect. This is what gives life just as much as Jesus gave life. He is the bread. It's, it's all one, and, it, and, it's, and it's amazingly complex and simple at the same time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to even expound on some of this because it's just, uh, it's just truth. Jesus Christ is saying these words. His, 
His words, their truth, their spirit, their life. That's what a person needs to get saved. We're wrapping this up. We're almost done. Verse 64, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Jesus knew, before he even picked Judas, he knew that Judas was the one to betray him. He knew from the beginning. He knew that he didn't believe, yet he allowed him to be with him. It says in verse 65, and he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of, the fa of my father. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Again, going back to my sermon from Sunday morning, Jesus' words are divisive. His own disciples, people that were following Jesus, all of a sudden, they heard him say something, they didn't like that very much. Maybe they didn't understand it, and they were just like, whoa, wait, what are you talking about here? They got offended, and they left and that's the most common reason why people get out of church in a church like this. Because they'll hear some things, they'll be like, hey, that's great, you know, they'll hear about feeding the 5,000, awesome, God's great mercy, He loves you, He's doing all this stuff for you, God wants you to live a great life, amen, that's great. But then as soon as they hear something a little bit hard, a little bit difficult, something that, you know, something maybe they don't want to hear, or something they don't quite understand, and I'm, let's see, I'm out of here. They get offended. And that's why um, Jesus said in verse 61, he says, Doth this offend you? Are you offended at this? Are you offended at my preaching? Are you offended at the words of God that give life? And many of his disciples walked away. I like what he does here in verse 67. Now, now look what Jesus does. Does he go running after and say, well, no, no, wait, you didn't understand me. No, come back. I want you, I want you to come back. No. He let him go. People are like, yeah, Go. You don't want to be a part of Jesus' ministry? If you don't want to be a disciple of Christ and follow what he has said, go. Now you're coming running after you. Look what he does then. He turns to his disciples in verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? So they're all gone too. Do you want to leave? Now's your chance. Here's the door. Go ahead. Don't let it take you on your way out. Go ahead. He's like, I'm here to do my father's will, and I'm going to keep on doing it. If you don't like it, if you're offended at this, Go on. You don't have to keep following me. That's the attitude that Jesus Christ had right here. He says, are you going to go also? Don't let God's word offend you. And don't let it offend you to the point where you're going to walk away from it. You're walk That's what they did. It says they walk no more with me. They stopped walking with Jesus. I don't even think they realized the repercussions of that. I mean, when you, when you stop walking with Jesus... I, mean, I want to be right next to Jesus. I don't want to stop walking with him. You're just going to get further and further into sin and further away from God. Don't get offended at the preaching. Don't get offended at God's word. Get offended at the preaching if I'm not preaching the Bible. If I'm just preaching my opinion, go ahead and get offended at me all day long. But if I'm preaching what the Bible says, don't get offended at God's word. Don't get offended from his truth. And don't go away from Jesus. Because you're not necessarily going to have someone running after you to come back. Verse number 68 says, Then Simon Peter answered him. And sees, Peter had the great attitude here. He had the right attitude. He says, Look, Lord, to whom shall we go? If we leave you, where are we going to go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So we don't want to leave you. We want to hear what you have to say. We know that you have the truth. We know that you're preaching the right thing. We know that you have the words of eternal life. We're not going to leave you. Where else can we go? You have the truth. We're going to stick close to you. Verse 69, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Is your confidence in Christ? Are you sure that Jesus is the Son of God? You ought to be. Are you just as sure in his word? The words that we have today? He gave them for us. He gave his life for us. And his life is, is, exists in these words. The words of God. They are spirit and they are life. Verse 70, Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Jesus knew from the beginning that Jesus knew that Judas was a devil. He knew that from the beginning. Um, Judas was never saved. He didn't lose his salvation when he committed suicide. He was a devil 
from the beginning. Jesus knew when he chose them, he didn't believe. He never believed throughout the ministry. And even when he repented at the end of his life and threw the pieces of silver back, yeah, he felt sorry for betraying Jesus because he knew Jesus was innocent. He felt bad about that, but he was a devil. He didn't get saved. He didn't put his faith on Christ. He just felt bad and killed himself. But anyways, we're going to get into that a little bit later in the book of John. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for the Bible. pray that you would please just uh, help us continue to learn. Open up these great truths in the Bible, dear Lord. It's so hard to, to preach through these great chapters. I want to spend so much time in all these different doctrines. Help me to uh, focus on the right ones, on uh, the areas where we can use some improvement in our lives. And we could... We could uh, just gain more understanding, dear God. I pray that you please continue to teach us. We love you. We thank you so much for, for giving us that bread from heaven, dear Lord, that, that we'll never be hungry again. We've partaken in that bread, dear Lord, that you've given us everlasting life. We love you for that. We thank you. I pray that you please help us to distribute this bread unto the multitudes as you've distributed it unto us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.